When you have a government that operates without limits, which proclaims the right to arrest, torture, and kill anyone, anywhere, with no warrants, no trial, no due process, when you have a government that militarizes the police and grants the armed forces the power to operate with impunity, within your own borders and beyond, a government that views you, the people, as the enemy, and treats you as such, when you have a government that lies to take you into wars of aggression, toppling country after country, killing countless innocent civilians, and sending your sons and daughters, your fathers and brothers home in flag-draped coffins, or disfigured and broken in mind and body, their lives destroyed in wars that serve only to line the pockets of an unelected cartel of bankers and corporations. When you have all of this right in front of you, so blatant, so clear, with president after president towing the line of the same agenda, you shouldn't have to be convinced that both parties in this political puppet show are owned and operated by the same interest. And you shouldn't have to be convinced that these overrated corporate popularity contests that some call elections are distractions that achieve nothing. And if you see where this is headed, you shouldn't have to be convinced that the system that you're living under must be brought to a halt. These are obvious conclusions for those who've been paying attention, so we won't try to convince you here. This video focuses solely on how to bring that system to a halt. Think of it as an instruction manual for a revolution. There are those who will be taken aback when you start using the word revolution. Revolution, the act of revolting and overturning the current power structure, is an extreme measure, one that should be handled with extreme caution, and in most cases, they should be avoided. Revolutions are dangerous in every sense of the word, and it is difficult if not impossible to predict their outcome. But there are times when allowing those in control to stay in control is even more dangerous. Right now, the question you need to ask yourself is this. Are we at that point yet? Can the current system be reformed? Revolutions begin with a no, and they end with a yes. Revolutions begin when you say no to those who claim to have power over you. And revolutions end when you accept a new status quo, a new normal, whether that new normal is an improvement or not. The causes of revolution are numerous in form, but there is one common root, and that's discontent. Discontent is the emotion that builds and builds under the surface. It is a storm which brews in the mind of the people, just waiting to be unleashed. The trouble is that it's much easier to unleash that storm than it is to get people in agreement as to what should come next. It's not easy to get people to see eye to eye regarding what needs to happen after the current system falls. So this is usually put off or avoided altogether. And that's a serious mistake. Without clear objectives, chaos usually sets in soon after the old regime falls. And then, in the power vacuum that's created, a tyrant rises to bring order. As a result, the systems that follow revolutions are often just as totalitarian or more totalitarian than those that they replace. It should therefore be abundantly obvious that discontent is not a sufficient driving force for a revolution. That is, if your goal is to actually leave a better world for your children and grandchildren. In order for enough people to have positive results, it must be driven by a clear and realistic vision. A vision that accounts for the world and humans the way that they actually are right now. Not the way that we wish they would be, or that we hope that they might be. And it must differentiate between that which can and cannot be changed in the short term. There is nothing more dangerous than armed men with utopian dreams. So, let's be realistic, shall we? We the people are divided. We have divided ourselves into classes and subclasses, liberals and conservatives, libertarians, anarchists, socialists, anarcho-socialists, minarchists, state-based free market capitalists, anarcho-capitalists, resource-based economy advocates, and more. There is absolutely no chance that any one of you is going to convince all the others that your way is the right way. Unless, of course, one of you rises to political power in the fray and enforces your beliefs by the barrel of a gun. This is the way it usually happens throughout history, and this is what we must avoid repeating. A movement is only successful if it starts with an idea that is strong enough to take root in the mind of the population and inspires and motivates people to spread it. It is possible for a diverse and divided people to form a coalition in times of great need and unify around an idea, but it only works if that idea meets the following three requirements. One. It must articulate a clear and defined common interest which allow the people to work together. The necessity for unification, even if that unification is temporary, needs to be evident to all stakeholders, and it must be accompanied by a sense of urgency which impels people to reach out to others in their community and spread the idea. 2. A clear vision of what you're working towards. What are you going to replace the current system with? Ironing out the fine details isn't actually productive. What's needed is a broad and abstract vision based on principles. In human societies, extreme and abrupt changes are usually destructive. All efforts must be made to retain social stability. And this means steering clear of any sort of utopian fantasies. The time to rewire humanity is not during a period of crisis. Historically, such attempts usually end in tragedy. 3. A plan of action and a clear understanding of the rules of engagement. We'll refer to these three elements collectively as the conscious revolution paradigm. You don't have to get mystical about it, it just means think before you act. 
Let's start with the common interest. Establishing the common interest is easy if you're informed. And if the people around you aren't informed, then your job is clear. Inform them. Whether you consider yourself a liberal or conservative or none of the above, the bankers and the corporations which hold the puppet strings of the state have placed us all on a path that leads to complete and total destruction. Our common interest is the world that we're leaving our children. The clear vision of what we're working towards is much harder. Again, there's nothing more dangerous than armed men with utopian dreams. And there's no greater symptom of utopianism than the illusion that we can convince the entire world to accept one monolithic belief system. Yet, at the same time, all great movements are driven by an idea. They are driven by a vision. How do we resolve this apparent contradiction? How do we find a common vision without falling for the naive fantasy that we can unify all worldviews? The answer is actually pretty simple. And that's a good thing, because only very simple ideas can be transmitted from person to person without breaking down. Our vision must start with the foundational understanding that there's not one single right way for humans to live on this planet, and that it is unacceptable to force others into any system without their consent, or to use violence or coercion to compel them to obey a set of rules that they never agreed to. That should just be common sense, but it's really not for most people. Most people like to use government thugs to enforce their good intentions. They just don't like it when it comes home to roost and the gun is pointed in their face. When the current system falls, there's going to be no way to reconstitute it in its old shape and size without violence and coercion, and even that probably wouldn't work. Therefore, the only real, ethical option is to accept that Humpty Dumpty isn't going to be put back together again. When it's time to rebuild, we don't need to figure out one system that everybody can fit under. Rather, we need to figure out an approach which facilitates multiple systems side by side. What would this look like? Well, imagine a network of small, voluntarily formed communities bound together in loose federations that cooperate for mutual defense and trade as needed, with decision-making taking place at the local level. It's a simple concept, one that's been applied many times throughout history. The most striking example, however, is the Iroquois Federation, which unified six tribes, each with their own cultures and traditions. The Iroquois Federation existed before the arrival of Columbus and lasted until 1779 when they were conquered militarily by the US. Many historians believe that the Iroquois Federation served as the original inspiration for the United States. The most striking difference being that the Iroquois Federation never had a central government. No one at the top had the power to force the member tribes to do anything whatsoever. And yet, this system worked, and it worked well for a very long time. So clearly this is not a utopian fantasy. It's a viable option, and it's the only option that can be enacted on a voluntary basis. The final element of the conscious revolution paradigm is the plan of action, the strategy and tactics, the short-term and long-term goals, and the structure of the movement. So let's start with the top-level strategy and move towards tactics. Some think of revolution in terms of bullets and bombs, but this is a misconception. Revolutions are about pulling the pillars of power out from underneath the state, one by one, until it falls. The state leans on three primary pillars of power. One, the control of the group mind, ideas, and beliefs. Two, the control of money, finance, and thereby human activity. And three, the monopoly on violence and the use of intimidation to extract obedience by fear. There are three stages of revolution, and they are sequential, and they correlate directly with the three pillars of power. The first is the ideological revolution. This is where we undermine the belief systems which support their control. This is where we systematically erode their illusion of legitimacy, their aura of power. We expose these criminals for the scoundrels that they are, and we inspire discontent among those who the state depends on for its functioning. If you're new to this, welcome to the party. It's already in full swing, and guess what? We're winning. The powers that be have lost control of the dialogue, and they know it. In recent decades, worldwide social change has experienced unprecedented historical acceleration, particularly because instant mass communications, such as radio, television, and the internet, cumulatively have been stimulating a universal awakening of mass political consciousness. The resulting widespread rise in worldwide populist activism is proving inimical to external domination of the kind that prevailed in the age of colonialism and imperialism. Persistent and highly motivated populist resistance of politically awakened and historically resentful peoples to external control has proven to be increasingly difficult to suppress. The second phase of the revolution is strategic non-compliance, or more accurately, defiance. This can take many forms and multiple approaches can be used at the same time. 
The goal of strategic non-compliance is to interrupt the chain of obedience for as long as possible, as many times as possible, to publicize that interruption on as large of a scale as possible, to document the police and or military brutality that follows, and to distribute that footage far and wide. The purpose of this is to damage the ruling party's image, because power is all about image. It's all smoke and mirrors. Once that image starts to break down, this inspires others to disobey. Monkey see, monkey do. And when this catches on and contagion sets in, it becomes a force of nature, like a tidal wave. It's all about reaching critical mass. What's crucial to understand here is that revolutions are almost entirely psychological in nature. In this context, building confidence is the most important element. Therefore, it's better to do small, successful operations and build up from there than it is to start with large, high-stakes events. The third stage of the revolution comes when the people have built up the necessary momentum to take the monopoly on violence out of the hands of the current regime. In the best of circumstances, such a transition can be relatively peaceful. But this is only possible when a significant portion of the police and the military have taken the side of the people. The police and military are the enforcement arm of the state, and without them, the powers that be have no power at all. Faltering governments almost always resort to brutal repression to attempt to stay in power. But this is often a fatal error. Even one refusal to follow an immoral order can set off a chain reaction that destroys the illusion of authority that they so carefully cultivate. Once that happens, it's game over. In East Germany on November 7th, 1989, the Communist Party ordered the military to put a stop to mass protests which had been growing throughout that year. The commander of the army refused, and he ordered his men to stand down. This sent a clear message that the Communist Party was no longer in control. This realization spread quickly through the population, and communism fell. Now since this is such a crucial element in the equation, it's not something that should be left up to chance. Every effort needs to be made right now to reach out to the police and military, to help them wake up to what's going on and to let them know that the people will support them if they break the chain of command. Now that we've outlined the big picture, let's look at two other key elements, leadership and organizational structure. Our current system relies on a hierarchical chain of command, a social pyramid which allows a small handful of individuals to control everyone else. In sociology, this is referred to as vertical collectivism. If our long-term vision is not compatible with such a structure, it would be foolish to build a resistance movement which copies it. Ends don't justify the means, the means will determine the end result. So if we want a decentralized, non-hierarchical federation of autonomous communities to replace the current system, the movement must be decentralized and non-hierarchical as well. This doesn't mean that there's no place for leadership. To the contrary, leadership is essential. The distinction needs to be made between leaders and rulers. Leaders walk ahead of the crowd. Rulers place themselves above the crowd. What's needed is a vast network of leaders independently motivated and capable of thinking for themselves, working to organize groups both locally in the real world and online, unified not by obedience to a single leader, but unified by an idea. Now, while this approach does present some challenges logistically, it has the advantage of making it virtually impossible to destroy the organization merely by getting rid of one or two leaders. A distributed organizational structure is much more resilient. So where are these leaders? Well, don't wait for them to appear. We need you to be one of those leaders. If you don't know how to be a leader, learn. Dealing with crowds is a skill, one that you can refine through practice and study. Anyone who wants to learn the basic psychology of uprisings and how to work with the public should study the following books intensely, reading them several times, taking notes and reflecting on what they say. Three books, The Crowd and The Psychology of Revolution by Gustave Le Bon and From Dictatorship to Democracy by Gene Sharp. These books are all available online to read and download for free. You'll find links to these books in the description of this video. Now, a word of warning, these books contain politics, opinions, and prejudices that I did not endorse. Like all books, they should be read with a critical mind, questioning everything that's said. However, they do offer a great deal of insight as to how to take power out of the hands of a tyrant. Leadership takes many forms and can mean many things depending on the situation. However, the primary job of leaders is to inspire people to take action, to organize people into groups so they can be more effective than isolated individuals, and to train others to do the same. Now, the final element you need to start your revolution is tactics. In the realm of violence, the state has a definitive advantage, and it would be foolish to engage them where they are strongest. Instead, we should use tactics that engage them where they are weakest. Fortunately, there's no shortage of nonviolent tactics which have been proven effective in toppling dictatorships. Gene Sharp's book From Dictatorship to Democracy lists 198, but those are by no means the only ones that can be used. The tactics employed by each group will depend on the mission and the specific goals of the group. The military divides itself into Army, Air Force, Navy, and Marines so that each can be specialized in the tactics of the terrain where they fight. Likewise, a nonviolent movement should have specialized groups for specific issues. This is already developing. We have PANDA, People Against the NDAA. PANDA is a national organization which has been working to fight the NDAA on a state and local level. 
and they've been having successes. What's most impressive is that the founder, Daniel Johnson, started this organization when he was 17. Also, there's the Oath Keepers, founded by Stuart Rhodes, which has been reaching out to the police and the military, reminding them of their oath, and preparing them psychologically to disobey when unconstitutional orders are handed down. The Oath Keepers have made a public stand against the NDAA, and they're gaining traction within the ranks. Others are organizing social media teams to collect and spread information. Others organize street activism, such as writing messages in chalk on sidewalks, or hanging up posters, or inserting small leaflets into books and magazines in the store. The possibilities are endless. Whether you start your own group, join an existing group, or act as an individual will depend on your disposition. No one can decide that for you. The most important thing is to take the first step and start doing something, anything. Take action and break the inertia of passivity. This is how you take back your power, one millimeter at a time. Now, right here in this 15 minutes, you've been given enough information to start a revolution. You might need to watch this video more than once and you will need to read those books. But now you have an instruction manual, something you can hand out to people and help them to learn. If you'd like more people to see this video, please share it through as many avenues as possible. Post it on Facebook, Twitter, on your blog, or send it to your friends via email. You have permission to download it, put it on disk, and distribute it on the streets. If you translate it, please post it as a video response so that it's easier for people to find. If you'd like more videos like this, subscribe to Storm Clouds Gathering on YouTube. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Storm Clouds Gathering, on Twitter at Collapse Updates. You can find us on Google Plus by doing a search for Storm Clouds Gathering, and our website is stormcloudsgathering.com.